we started the machine. Kesha, just give an access of our keyboard and mouse. Thank you. For broadcast, sir. Thank you. Morning, everyone. We'll just start in like two, three minutes. Morning, Neeraj. Morning. Just seeing people joining and still joining and give us like a minute or two and we'll get started. Right, right. We can start. I think we've got a good crowd to start the session. Good morning, everyone. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you to this webinar, uh, KSAE invoicing that we've jointly organized uh, with 
Signet as our implementation partner. My name is Deepa Agarwal. I'm an associate partner with WTS Dhruva based out of uh, Dubai and I'll be the moderator uh, for this webinar. Uh, you know, considering that KSE is looking at implementing e-invoicing in a phased manner and, and the phase one starts on 4th December this year, uh, with less than three months, I'm sure uh, most of you would have somewhere started implementing at least the phase one. Now, you know, with that background, if you can move to the next slide, please. Akash, can we move to the next slide, please? Yes. Sorry, sorry for the technical glitch. Yes. So, you know, with that background, I thought, you know, what we plan to do is in the next 40, 45 minutes is uh, just just take an overview around uh, what's the whole e invoicing uh, look like. Uh, we'll kind of spend some 10 minutes around what are the challenges, uh, what we perceive in, in, in phase one. Uh, you know, followed by a 25 to a 30 minutes uh, uh, session where we look at uh, how could you know businesses meet these challenges and 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 Signet as our partners have really developed a proprietary solution around uh, implementing a, 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 a compliance compliance efficient uh, solution for uh, K, KSA invoicing. Right, and finally, if time permits, we'll have some uh, Q&A. Uh, some housekeeping rules, you know, if you are facing any technical difficulty, please feel free to drop a message on the chat box and our technical team will get in touch with you. Uh, if you have any questions, please post it on the chat box and we'll try to address it at the end of this session. And uh, just for your information, the webinar is recorded and we'll be happy to share the recording at the end of the session. In terms of the team today, I'll be moderating the session as I mentioned. Uh, Geet Shah is a director with WTS Dhruva. He'll be kind of talking around the overview and the challenges from a VAT perspective. Uh, Neeraj uh, Hathi Singh, who's the founder and director of Signet Infotech, along with Akash Chopra, who's a project, a project ma a product manager uh, with Signet, will be taking us through the uh, you know actual technical requirement and potentially what uh, challenges one could face both phase one and phase two uh, from an IT implementation perspective. Right. Uh, as we move to the next slide, uh, I'm sure you would agree the tax landscape uh, in in Middle East and more particularly in GCC has been ever evolving. And with the introduction of VAT in 2018 and 2019. Uh, uh, again, there is a lot of discussion around BEPS 2.0, Pillar 1, Pillar 2, corporate tax, you know, minimum corporate tax at the rate of 15%. There's a lot of, you know, uh, momentum in the tax uh, uh, arena itself. So from that perspective, even the government is kind of looking to invest heavily from a te technology uh, perspective. That's where, you know, uh, e-invoicing really uh, comes into the fore. For and, and, and I'm sure some of you would be aware the idea behind e-invoicing is multifold, you know. So it is to look at tran digitally transforming a business or the government. Uh, it could look at, you know, uh, ensuring there's no tax evasion, elimination of a parallel black economy, uh, giving equal opportunities to businesses. Again, more from a tax control perspective also. Uh, again, you know, Middle East or GCC is not the first region that is implementing uh, VAT. There are regions, there are countries that have already gone ahead. For instance, Japan, Taiwan, China, very recently India. Are the, these are countries which have already implemented uh, uh, e-invoicing. So from that perspective, you know, our partner Signet really bring in a lot of value because they've really handled these uh, projects in, in, in these countries. And now, now if you look at uh, e-invoicing from a Middle East perspective, uh, Egypt was the first country that introduced e-invoicing and it made it, it, it started in November 2020, which is when this specific 134 country companies uh, were kind of mandated to implement it. it, it. But what is expected is starting January 2022, 
uh, all taxpayers will be mandated to implement uh, uh, e-invoicing and, and to the effect that the law will not allow you to claim input tax based on paper invoices. KSA again, as 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 I said, it's a phased approach, and I'm sure Geet will speak more around it. But the deadlines, you know, is it's fourth December 2021, and then in a phased manner again starting first January 2023. Uh, uh, UAE, you know, uh, again, what we've seen is UAE typically kind of uh, has been a follower in terms of the implementation of uh, technology and. Uh, in terms of our understanding of how the FTA has been moving ahead on technology, there has been a preparation happening internally on the tech architecture. And I wouldn't really be surprised if we see the announcement on e-invoicing uh, in the very new near future in, in UAE. Qatar, again, you know, it does not have VAT. I'm sure it should get introduced in a year or two, but uh, it has other taxes. So uh, what we understand, what we understood is Qatar has already introduced a digital tax platform uh, with SAP as the base technology and, and therefore I do not see any uh, reason why Qatar will not implement K invoicing from uh, uh, e-invoicing from uh, day one. Now with that, you know, I would request my colleague Geet to kind of take you all through the overview and the challenges that we've come across in terms of implementing uh, e-invoicing. Geet, over to you. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, thank you, Deepak, for the introduction and setting up the stage. Uh, just a second, I'll move to the next slide. Yeah. So, uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. As Deepak mentioned, invoice as a tax balance is gradually picking up in the Middle East, and one of the main reasons for the introduction is to reduce underreporting and fraud. Now, in most countries, the invoicing is focused on B2B supplies. However, KSA is implementing a hybrid model whereby it will be applicable for both B2B and B2C invoices. I'm sure by now most of you would have attended a Zatka workshop on this subject. However, just to recap and bring more clarity, I'll talk about the invoicing framework in phase one and phase two and the key challenges that could be faced by the companies during implementation. Now, the first phase of invoicing is the generation phase where all the companies, irrespective of the turnover, are expected to raise an invoice through an e-invoicing software and discontinue raising a manual or a paper book invoices. In the phase one, uh, will be implemented from 4th of December as Deepak mentioned. Now, some of you might wonder why such an odd date. And the reason behind that is that the invoicing regulation was first introduced in on 4th of December, 2020, and it becomes effective after 12 months. And therefore the date is the 4th of December, 2021. Now, in terms of the flow, uh, the supplier will be required to generate an invoice and has to share it with the customer. Now, uh, in, either by taking a print or by email. In case of a B2B, uh, life remains as is, except for the fact that invoice needs to be raised with an e-invoicing software. For B2C supplies, simplified in tax invoice needs to be raised with a QR code as an additional requirement. The customer should be able to scan the QR code and get the basic information about the supplier the time and date of raising an invoice and should contain the invoice details such as the invoice amount and the VAT amount. Companies will be required to archive the invoice data in a local server in KSA or in a cloud server. The invoices are to be stored in an electronic format. Currently, there is no uh, clarity on uh, what, do they, what do they mean by electronic format, but uh, most companies are advised to uh, save the invoice data in an XML file as what is expected in phase two. Now, if I... Uh, and the next slide, please. Yeah, so for B2B supplies, uh, uh, again, in phase two, there could be two models of invoicing. It will be implemented in batches starting from 1st of January, 2023. As we have seen in Egypt, uh, they have first introduced it for large taxpayers and then uh, for all the other taxpayers. Similarly, in uh, KSA, we will have uh, the implementation in batches, uh, first for the last large taxpayers and then for other all other taxpayers. For B2B supplies, there is an integration model and for B2B, B2C uh, supplies, there will be a reporting model. The invoice generated for B2B supply will have to go through a Zatka platform. The invoicing software that is being managed by the company has to be integrated with a Zatka platform through an API. Once the invoice is approved by the platform, the invoice will be sent back to the supplier, which then can be later shared with the buyer and all the invoices have to be archived in a, in a, in a server as we discussed earlier. 
Now for B2C, uh, there is a reporting model whereby a simplified invoice will continue to be raised with a QR code uh, with a few additional information. Now here the catch is that Zadka will ask companies to upload the B2C invoices in an XML file into their platform. So uh, Zadka will have a full uh, uh, clarity or reporting on the B2B supplies and the B2C supplies uh, being made by a, a particular company. Now, in terms of the QR code, uh, it will be mandatory for both B2B and B2C invoices to have a QR code. Uh, it should have basic information about the seller uh, and the invoice details about such as invoice amount and the VAT amount. Apart from this, uh, there has to be a, a hash of XML file, a cryptographic stamp and a UUID. Uh, these are some of these are uh, technical terms and I'm sure uh, Akash will take you through and explain what are these technical terms. But as of now, these are the uh, particulars that uh, needs to be there in a QR code. The invoice data which is generated uh, has to be stored in an XML file or a PDF or a A3 file with an embedded XML uh, as, as, a, as a record. Now, uh, let's move to the next. Uh, uh, now, before we move to this, uh, I'd like to have a poll on a particular on, on these two phases. Uh, if uh, Kesha, if you can. So, uh, so in terms of, uh, we'd like to get a poll on whether uh, input tax can be recovered on a simplified invoice after 4th of December 2021. If uh, audience can uh, give their opinion on, on this particular uh, question. Yeah, maybe we could just end the poll geek. Yeah, so uh, the answer to so most of you have answered that yes, uh, input tax should be, uh, should be available as uh, on the simplified tax invoice. Uh, uh, this is a tricky, uh, and I'll, I'll discuss more about this in in my subsequent slides. So, uh, to first, I'll talk about the invoice sequence series. So, one of the key challenges in phase one is the invoice sequence. Now, the current business practice in most companies is. Uh, using a multiple invoice series across locations, ERP and billing softwares. Now under an invoicing regime, companies may use may have to use only a single invoice, either at each location or uh, at each billing software, irrespective of the number of users using the uh, POS uh, billing software. Now let's, let's take an example of a supermarket. Now if a supermarket in a one location has a one software with 10 users, then it is likely that one invoice series has to be used across the 10 POS systems and uh, that needs to be followed uh, at each location. Now we, we are still seeking more clarity from the Zatka on this particular issue, but it is most likely that a company will be required to follow one invoice sequence per software uh, at each, uh, for this particular compliance. Now if I go to the next slide, Next slide, please, uh, Kesha. Yes, so on the input tax recovery, so uh, currently the business practice is that input tax is recovered either based on a standard invoice or based on a simplified tax invoice. And as per the law, uh, companies entitled to recover input tax even on a simplified invoice. However, in the invoicing regime, this could change. Uh, because what is indicated in a detailed uh, guideline issued by the invoice uh, on invoicing by Zadka that B2C invoices are particularly to be used only for uh, uh, to be issued only for the end consumers and not for the B2B customers. And therefore, uh, going forward, it could be possible that a simplified tax invoice could only be used for a B2C supply and a standard tax invoice to be used for B2B supply because uh, uh, as a way forward in the integration phase, what Zatka is looking at is that the whatever the sales has been reported by the supplier has to be then matched with the purchases by the recipient. And therefore, this integration comes into play. And if there is a simplified tax invoice, then the recipient's tax details are not captured in a simplified tax invoice. And therefore, it is quite likely that uh, input tax recovery will only be possible with a uh, standard invoice. 
So, Geet, if I may come in here, so what I understand from you is basically uh, businesses going forward will have to insist on a full tax invoice rather than a simplified tax invoice. And, and it's up to the vendor now whether he his system is capable of issuing those full invoices for uh, supplies, those are below 1000 uh, Saudi riyals, right? So, and currently what is happening Deepak, is that in most supermarkets, uh, we have seen that company, uh, the store reprints the simplified tax invoice. Now, this may not be possible. Now, uh, whenever a customer insists on a standard invoice, they have to direct it to a particular uh, counter for getting a standard invoice raised with the details of the recipient, the TRN details and all of that, and to recover the input tax on a particular invoice. So it is going to be a challenging one, yes. Yeah, yes, the point of yeah, pointer from my side is that this is going to be technically extremely challenging at the POS systems because if they do not implement a centralized system, then kind of a converting a simple invoice or a B2C invoice into B2B is going to be very difficult. And as per the Zetka guidelines, and if I understand correctly, it is not required that you need to issue a B2C invoice only to a certain value. It's like if for a POS of POS system or a, for a, a kind of thing, you can go even for a higher value uh, amount, even if it's a B2C thing. But for a POS system to issue this and keeping the kind of a sequencing uh, in kind of mind and not being able to change the invoice, it's going to be a very, very challenging thing. And this is a very challenging technical question that needs to be addressed properly at a centralized system. That is what our understanding and our discussions with multiple large uh, retailers has been. Correct, correct, Nidhi. So, um, moving to the next slide. Uh, so, the another challenge that I, I, we could foresee, foresee was on the modification of invoices. Currently, what is happening is that businesses can modify or cancel or delete the invoice which is raised. Uh, but in the invoicing regime, this may, may not be possible. Uh, each invoice cancellation or a modification has to be through a credit note uh, to ensure that uh, the reporting is done correctly. So everything has to be through a credit note and any modification has to be through a credit note. So this is going to be a big challenge and companies need to put controls in place to ensure that this is being followed. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a fourth. Uh, this is the biggest challenge that we could foresee on month end closing and JV entries. Now, generally, what happens is that companies have a, a window of first week open for passing the month end and JV entries, which impacts the VAT liability of a particular company. And companies generally keep the books open till the first week of next month. Now, with a single invoice series, this may not be possible under the e invoicing regime. Companies have to either uh, pro, either keep the books open and not raise new invoices in the next new uh, in the next month or have a hard close and ensure that uh, the sequence is followed so this is going to be the biggest uh, challenge that we could foresee for companies in in closing their month end uh, books and for mis reporting uh, moving to the next question uh, on advanced payment and deemed supply so currently what is happening is that most of the companies manually discharge vat obligation on their advanced payments and on the deemed supplies uh, which are made to uh, for the free gifts which are given to employees or uh, to their customers. Now, under the invoicing, uh, the detailed guidelines suggest that every uh, supply has to be there, an invoice has to be there as a supporting. So for every advance payments, uh, invoice has to be generated. Now companies have to fix their AR modules to see how invoice can be generated for advance payments and at, at the same time, uh, ensure that the, re the amount which is received is not recognized as a revenue. So this is going to be another big challenge on, on raising an invoice for advanced receipts and for deemed supply. Now moving to the next uh, uh, challenge is on the employee recoveries and deductions. So currently what is happening is most of the companies are paying VAT on the employee recoveries or deductions manually and, and pay the tax at the time of filing of returns. Similarly for employee discounts in case a, uh, employee discount is uh, is to be ignored and that has to be paid on the gross value. What is being done currently is that most of the companies at the time of filing the returns, they calculate the uh, VAT liability on the employee discounts manually. Now under the invoicing, uh, for every employee recovery or a deduction, there has to be a e invoice. So this is going to be another uh, challenge that uh, companies have to, uh, to uh, face and on the employee uh, discounts, uh, even 
there we have the discount has to be treated as a tender and ensure that the VAT is uh, calculated on the gross value. This is something that needs to be taken care of uh, at the in the invoicing regime. Now moving to the next uh, slide, please. So I'll I'll now hand over to Akash to discuss more on the te technical aspects and what are the challenges that uh, could be faced by the companies in phase two uh, as as part of the implementation. Thanks, Geet. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. So now we'll, we have seen that what all uh, business challenges or the tax position challenges this e-invoice is going to bring to your uh, corporations and your operations. Um, but it's not just limited to those business operation or tax positions. The e-invoicing has a quite big impact on the IT infrastructure side of your POS and ERPs as well. Now we will talk about some of these challenges going ahead, but before we could jump onto that, I'll quickly want to ask you a question around the QR code generation. So I'm just launching a poll. Kindly provide your feedback. I must say the QR code generation is going to be the most critical aspect uh, as far as the phase one implementation goes. So I hope uh, uh, most of your POS systems are either ready or you have understood uh, that part. I'll be closing the poll in say next five to 10 seconds. Thank you all for sharing the feedback, but it looks like uh, uh, almost 70% of uh, you have uh, said that the uh, the PO system that is being installed or being used by your IT systems are not capable of generating the QR code. And I would say 30% of you are ready. So that's a good thing for those 30% of the, of the attendees here. Uh, now I'll, I'll talk about, it's not just limited to the QR code. Uh, but the overall implication of the phase phase one in general. I just wanted to add a couple of points on the QR code side. Like for the people who are already ready in terms of uh, being able to generate the QR code, a very important technical aspect needs to be uh, thought through that the QR code is not re readable. It's like the generated QR code should not be readable into a normal format. They have given a very specific requirement that it has to be readable in a TLV format. Now that thing in lot of uh, clients that we have discussed, a lot of people that we have discussed with have missed out onto it. So this is a kind of a very important thing that go through the specifications in a kind of uh, detail and you will get clear clarity in how the QR code has to be generated. So that is important for people to know. And it's just not simply that QR code generation is not enough because the sequencing aspect has to be taken care of into the entire process and how you will take care of the phase one as well as the phase two because many of the clients that are discussed are looking at phase one in isolation to phase two. This is going to be a very challenging uh, going further because a lot of requirements in phase one are a small subset of what is going to come into phase two. So not to look phase one in isolation is important. That is one thing. Second thing is the format of the QR code and the technicalities around it should be kind of understood in detail. These are the two pointers from my side. Yes, Akash, please continue. Yeah. I think very rightly highlighted uh, by Neeraj here. So uh, this QR code needs to be encoded in a TLV format. So all the five fields which uh, are required for to be part of the QR code in phase one, uh, should be encoded in a TLV and probably Gazette might come up with a mobile app or some other service using which the buyers could scan that QR code. So that's that's an important note on the on the QR code. Now 
uh, as as rightly mentioned by Neeraj, there are three critical prohibited uh, functions uh, for the phase one. We'll talk about that first and then about the regular aspects of the phase one because the other things are pretty much there if you are using a, a, a ERP or a POS and most of the invoices nowadays are already in an electronic format. Uh, but but the challenge that come up, comes up with the prohibited functions is the tampering of the invoices on uh, your credit notes or even your logs. So any system that you are using currently to generate the invoices should not have any capability to, to the user where they can go back and modify an invoice that is generated. This applies to your AR invoices only. Uh, just be, be aware of that that uh, the invoicing overall applies to your sales invoices only. So there could be possibility that the invoice you are recording for your payable part, you might have to change it if there's a error, manual error in actually recording the invoice. But all your AR invoices, which are your supply invoices, once they are entered into the system, you will not be able to cancel them. You will have to either net off with a credit note or modify using a debit note. And same goes for the logs. So if your invoicing system, if your ERP or your POS is not having proper audit trail and audit logs, it will not be considered as a compliant software. So that's another very important uh, requirement there. And talking about sequencing, there has been a lot of confusion around the overall sequencing requirement. And uh, there is yet to be, uh, we are yet to receive more information from Gazette on to the particular way. But as a conservative approach, what we recommend all, all our uh, uh, corporates who are talking to us is uh, that having a central system which could manage the sequencing of all their invoices could solve a potential challenge and uh, keep them uh, at a safer approach rather than uh, taking, a, uh, taking a riskier approach by going with a different sequencing at each post terminal or at each branch. So those are the prohibited functions. Now, what are the basic things that you need to comply on the, on the phase one side? So local archival. Now, most of the POS systems that you use are not having any local archival capabilities. Uh, either those are integrated with an ERP or they are uh, uh, integrated to a data warehouse. But in both of those cases, the terminal from where the invoice is getting generated, there should be a capability to locally archive the data. Uh, what it means is that the data should be exported into a folder from where anyone can access it, including Gazette, in, in case needed. As well as the data field validations. So far, uh, Gazette did not had any requirement on the data fields that you need to maintain or to send to them uh, in, the, in the VAT regulation because uh, you were only supposed to submit a summary VAT return. But since going forward, all the transactions are going to flow to Gazette in phase two, they have started asking or uh, having the implementation on the data field aspect. So right from phase one, there are around 50 to 60 fields which are mandatory to be stored for both B2C as well as B2B invoices. While when the phase two will be completely implemented, the fields uh, rise to our, almost around 116. So that are the number of fields that as a business you need to either maintain, mandatorily maintain or conditionally depending on the type of business you are doing. So that's another critical aspect that you, your IT and uh, as well as your tax teams will have to work into together and figure it out uh, a way of recording and validating those things. And there are solutions in the market which can help you validate those data and keep it in check so your compliances are being followed. Tempering proof, we have already discussed that it is, uh, it is a prohibited function. And lastly is the audit log. Again, as I mentioned that each of your systems should be having an audit, audit log in place. And as Nilesa rightly highlighted that looking at phase one in isolation is not going to solve a long-term challenge. This whole implementation is in a combination. So, Looking at phase one and phase two as a combined project, as a, as a single unit of implementation and a business process uh, automation should be considered. And for the same reason, we are also talking about the technical things that need to be taken care of when the phase two comes into place. So the first and foremost thing that is uh, very critical is the XML data generation or the XML format generation. So all the, all the invoices and all the records that you generate in your system should be converted to an XML format. Now, most of you would not even know what an XML is, but it is a, a, a markup language, which is only understood by, let's say, a, a software program. And this is going to be used by Gazette to have your data inserted into their software or inserted into their platform. 
So that's why all the data that you are having right now in your ERP or POS, currently it would be either in an Excel or a CSV format, but that also needs to be into an XML. Uh, also, we are recommend. Akash, uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I would want uh, uh, Geet and Deepak also to touch base uh, during this uh, solution. One particular aspect, we just come into multiple uh, client questions. That one is we will be storing the invoicing data. We will be storing the uh, B2C invoices or the simple invoices into it. We will have our B2B invoices being generated into an electronic format, but the total of this invoices and total of what we file into a VAT return kind of vary different because of different aspects around it. Because uh, we may be taking some exemptions, we may be kind of following certain rules. But the VAT return values and the invoicing total that we kind of generate from our sales would be vary. So how important it is to have a kind of a very high quality reconciliation ready into between my VAT returns and between my invoicing amounts. How important it is. This is something I will want uh, Deepak and Deep to touch base during the once either through the question answers at any other point during this webinar. Yes, actually. Sure, yeah, I think uh, that that's one of the key challenges that we have uh, we have discussed with our uh, our corporates uh, so far, right? So we are talking about the XML generation of the data, very technical thing. But along with that XML generation, uh, the, the, the sellers needs to also generate a UUID number. Now UUID number is a unique number in the universe and it, it would be the unique identifier of the invoice that is going to be generated from your system. So when phase two comes into picture, not just your B2B invoices, but your B2C invoices will also need to have a UUID number. So we highly recommend that uh, there needs to be a centralized solution which uh, which can help you generate all of these numbers and that's why we are talking that okay phase one and phase two should be looked into conjunction because all of these requirements especially the uuid is going to bring in a lot of challenges for the for the b2c invoice generation the simplified invoice generation now the qr code which is printed on these invoices will also need to have the xml hash and the uuid as a part of the uh, of the data that is being stored into the qr code so that's another area of the upgrade but since in phase one we are already going to generate the qr code this will only be just adding few more fields to it uh, but the fields which are going to be added are going to become uh, be the be the key implementation challenge for your IT teams, and uh, that's why uh, we have we recommended a central system. So the the fields which we talk about is the cryptographic stamp. So cryptographic stamp will be a digital signature which you need to imprint on each and every invoice, and it is going to be unique per invoice because uh, the data onto the invoice needs to be part of that signature as well as uh, uh, each of the seller needs to get a public certificate and a public key from the gadget using which they could generate that signature. So that stamp will also be need to be printed on each and every invoice. And along with it, lastly, once all of this data is generated, uh, the system should also create a hash of all these XML data. So what is hash, if you may ask, in simple terms, it is encrypting a data into a format which is only uh, readable by a particular software plus it is something which is used for blockchains as well so blockchain network relies on hash of data to ensure the authenticity of a particular uh, data as such so if you change anything on a date in the data the hash changes so depending on a particular value of a hash anybody is able to determine whether the data is tampered or the data is uh, authentic so that's why authorities are going ahead with a hash of of the data in the implementation and all of this information including the hash the uuid and the xml uh, will be required to be submitted to the gadget now how the submission would happen it will not be a manual import or a manual upload of file it will be only through a secure encrypted channel of api api is application program interface and it relies on uh, how our, our mobile app softwares work so using using that interface the data will be pushed onto the gadget platform and uh, they will validate or clear the invoice as Geet had highlighted in the in the phase two implementation for b2b it will be quite a challenge because right from where the invoice gets generated it will be real-time push onto the gadget platform 
So until and unless you get a clearance from the gazette, you won't be able to issue the invoice to, to your uh, buyer. So that's where you need to ensure that the real-time integration as well as the platforms that you're going ahead for your invoicing solution are capable enough of uh, managing large volumes, managing real-time, have, have good uh, uh, response times, as well as have experience with integrating with large governments uh, APIs. And for the B2C invoices as such, for that the integration won't be real time, but it will be on a, on, on a batch mode, probably in a 24 hours or maybe whatever time frame Gazette will share across with, uh, with, 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 with the um, taxpayers. Uh, in that case, you also need to ensure that the data is validated beforehand because the invoice is already handed over to the buyer and at a later stage, you are pushing the data to Gazette. So in case there is any error into the data, it will be quite a challenge for you to go and uh, you know, do the credit note generation and issue a new invoice because a buyer has already left your store. So you cannot uh, depend on, on the data validation to be done at a later stage. So even for B2C invoices, we recommend real-time integration with some systems so that the data is validated, the QR code is managed, as well as whenever uh, Gazette uh, is required of the data, we can, it, we can, it can be pushed on a real-time or, or on a batch mode. So I think that's more or less on the, on the technical aspects for the phase one and phase two. Now we will talk about these were more on the challenges that uh, or the changes that are required into your IT infrastructure uh, and into your tech stack architecture landscape as such. As, as Signet Infotech, we have experience uh, of working with uh, in, in India GST softwares and India GST provider for over a long period. And uh, through this experience, we have built a platform which is flexible and scalable. Uh, to handle handle the integration with, with the authorities as well as integrate with the POS and the ERP softwares as such. So we'll qu quickly show you how a particular ideal uh, landscape of your tech stack architect should look like once you have implemented uh, a centralized system which takes care of your invoicing needs. So uh, when in particularly we talk about, uh, let's say for a short term goal, which is phase one, Though the solution that we are providing will be uh, future proof, but just for the simplicity of the explanation, I'll first explain how the phase one integration would happen. So here we can see that there will be a central system, which we call a compliance platform, and uh, it will be handling your e-invoicing compliances as a whole. And that system has got web APIs and a lot of other integration right out of the box so that it easily integrates with the POS terminals and the POS software that you have, as well as the ERP systems that you have in place. So at a moment when uh, any invoice is getting generated at a POS terminal through an enriched API, the data is pushed onto the central platform. And this platform can help you do all the compliances. When I say all the compliances, it, it will generate the QR code. It will generate a unique sequence number and it will provide that as a response to the POS system. Our system also has got XML generation into place, which is going to come into phase two, but since it has a capability, we will also generate and store the XML of the data right from phase one. So in case going future, authorities require a backdated uh, data in an XML format, it is there with you to be submitted. Now this QR code and the unique sequence which is generated by this uh, platform or a central system will be given back to your PO systems in real time. When I say real time, the overall operation uh, is finished in less than 500 milliseconds. So when a customer is standing at your POS terminal and uh, the user is generating the invoice, it would not add up more than one second into the overall operation of the data being pushed onto the central system and then your QR, your POS terminal getting the QR code back and printing it on the invoice. So that's that's the overall infrastructure that we recommend. In case you have uh, your POS terminals are not able to connect to internet, then we would still recommend that we have some element of the software deployed onto your branches 
for each, each and every branch of yours, there will be a, a singular platform or a central platform, which can help you generate those QR codes and etc. But in that, those cases, the sequencing can only be ensured at a branch level, not at a at an organization level, because uh, those systems are not connected to a central platform, but they are branches working as individual entities. So that's an overall implementation or the tech stack architecture landscape for phase one. For phase two, what, what we recommend is same system. Uh, you, nothing needs to change from an implementation standpoint. So uh, our system will be upgraded and enhanced to have the additional capabilities which are required to be compliant for phase two. So right from the technical aspects that we discussed, uh, the XML generation, the UID generation, which is a unique number universally, as well as the cryptographic stamp. And lastly, the hash of the XML, which is again uh, encrypted uh, data. All of these things will be generated by this singular platform, a central system. And the integration with the POS and ERP stays as is. So if you understand this from a, a corporate standpoint, it is a very safe approach. The reason being once the integration is done, when the phase two go live, there is not going to change much because the same system is there, the integration is already there, the data is flowing. It's just that there are some additional fields which are added to the overall compliance, compliance platform. And the same platform also connects with the gadget through the secure channels and it submits the data to gadget and brings back the acknowledgement, which is then given back to your ERP. So if you if you uh, recall, for B2B invoices, you need to have the gadget acknowledgement and gadget clearance in real time. So this system can help you have that right from the ERP, the data comes to this uh, central system, it validates, it generates all the required data, sends it to gadget and brings back the acknowledgement and gives you into the ERP. And then from there, you can either send that email, uh, that invoice to your uh, buyer and so forth. So that's the overall uh, solution that we suggest for the uh, for, for, or for a complete invoicing solution. Let's not call it phase one or phase two. It's a complete invoicing solution for, for the current uh, compliance requirement. Now, this was about more about how the solution should function or what we recommend as a, as a overall tech stack landscape. But when should you start working on such, such project or such a compliance implementation? Uh, to be precise, now, I would say, because ideally we recommend that there should be at least three to four weeks kept for the UAT of such a, such a system, which is a business critical application it is going to impact the way the invoices are getting generated. So we highly recommend that uh, uh, the whole month of November should be given just for the UAT and the testing of the system. So if you plan backwards, that leaves you hardly with uh, four to six weeks of, of implementation timeframe if we, if we talk about September and October month in general. And uh, we, we recommend that at least six to eight weeks should be kept for the integration and the implementation. So in a, in a whole, we need at least 12 weeks, but we are right neck to neck at the moment. So uh, a, a quick decision is required at each, every front at, at, at the IT teams, as well as at the business teams to, to look for such solutions and start the discussion around uh, upgrading your tech stake landscape such that in, when the phase two is uh, implemented or even when the phase one is implemented, uh, you are ready and compliant from day one and not having any business business impact of this invoicing. The things that you should keep in mind is uh, ensuring that the business team is always involved in the scoping, as well as the cross-function coordination is in place and the user trainings are happening uh, correctly. And lastly, always have a plan B because this is a business critical application as I explained. So. Uh, uh, having a plan B will always help you. And uh, our solution always helps you do that. The reason being we are working with large organizations and we have always kept into our application, there is a disaster recovery and other uh, uh, development requirements kept into place from day one only. So, now enough of discussion around the overall compliance solution and the planning. Now let's have a look at uh, the actual software that we have prepared or that we have in place and see how on when on 4th of December, when the things go live, 
how it is going to function or how a, a centralized system can help you comply. Uh, Kesha, I would need to share my screen. Can you give me the presenter rights, please? I hope my screen is visible. Yes, it is. Just give me one minute. I'll quickly log into our platform. I'll quickly show you how the overall uh, data goes from one point to the other point. And uh, So into the system right now what i'm showing you is how uh, a document gets imported into our platform this is a real-time data so a text document which which is an invoice or a credit note or debit note gets imported into the system our system creates a copy of, of that particular data and then pushes the data to the respected respected government authorities and right from that it also updates the statistics which are required to be maintained as a part of the compliance, as well as uh, from the response of the government, it sends the notification back to the ERPs. And all of these uh, activities or tasks are being tracked in real time. And if any of these actions are failing at any point in time, those are also being highlighted to the respective authorities. So ideally what would happen is, if this whole integration is happening on an end-to-end -end basis and while the invoices are flowing from your ERP to our system and from there to the government portal, at any point on uh, uh, flow, if anything fails, uh, you, your IT team as well as the respective persons are being, uh, being notified and then the, the corrective actions can be taken. So uh, any business which is impacted through this we can have uh, the plan be in place, as well as if there is a downtime from the government side, we can see it clearly that this thing is not working or anything is failing because of, uh, of the compliance or because of the API issue from the government's endpoint. End I think uh, that's that's more or less it from the technical part of uh, how the invoicing is going to work and uh, how our solution can help you work onto those side. Now I'll ask uh, Deepak and Niraj sir to probably take things forward and if uh, take some questions if I, we have the uh, time time available. I think we have got a few questions. Sure. Thanks, Akash. Thank you so much. Uh, that was really insightful. I'm, I'm still struggling with some of the, uh, you know, uh, summarized words that you use, UUID and uh, whatnot. So I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, by a lot of uh, companies. And, and especially, you know, the poll question that we had initially, I was a bit surprised that 70% of people still do not have a QR code on their invoice. And, and 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 I'm I'm again you know a bit skeptical that even with the with that the balance thirty percent the point around having it having a TLV right encoded uh, QR code is something that needs to be looked at 
uh, by by most of the companies that really need to implement uh, okay uh, e invoicing in in KSA. Yeah, so uh, just add to the sorry to add to that uh, most of the cost players or the ERP and they will be able to provide the phase one very easily to extend because they are already into the system they will be do that but when it comes to the even discussion around the phase two it is going to be very challenging because it's a very unique system that uh, the that guy has come up with and that is something which is uh, quite different than the other systems around it and lot of security aspects encryptions and technical aspects need to be taken care into the phase two. So looking right. at phase one and phase two in isolation is going to be very challenging. And uh, it's important that uh, whoever you like the companies work with have a strategy around phase one and phase two both. I agree. I agree with you. Right. So we have a question here in terms of uh, whether the invoices need to be sorry, not invoices. QR code, I believe, should be in Arabic or English. Geet, you want to pick that up? Yes, okay. QR code uh, can be in English if I'm not wrong. But uh, so uh, there is no requirement to have it in Arabic. But yeah, the details has to be there uh, mentioned in the QR code. Mm -hmm. Sure. And it has to be encrypted in the TLB format. So that is an additional requirement. So QR code can be into yeah. either of them. Right, right. The next question is how and whether e invoices apply to exports. Uh, yeah. I think this should be straightforward, right, Geet? Yes. So, yeah. Yes, the invoice is applicable for uh, exports. So any taxable supply being made, uh, an invoice will have to be generated. Only exception being the exempt supply. So only in case of an exempt supply, uh, invoice may not be required. For all other cases, yes, the invoice will be required. Right. Right. The another one it says, can you just bit uh, elaborate on self-built invoices. So self-built invoices uh, is uh, uh, same as what we, uh, so if a buyer raises an invoice or a uh, agent raises an invoice that uh, self-built invoice has to be kept and has to be uh, uh, kept as a record. Uh, there is no particular exception or a different uh, treatment for that. It has to be an e-invoice that needs to be generated for all any of the self-built invoices. That's mm -hmm. a condition only. And, and I think uh, the the details around how will it actually work in process is something we are awaiting from Satka, right, Neeraj? Yes, that is something we are working. But Geet, to make uh, this uh, self invoicing question a little bit more complex for you, that in the self invoicing uh, in self uh, invoices, there are two uh, parts to it. One for which we may be taking the credit of it, and one for which we will not be taking because they are exempted. So where do you treat them in the simple invoices or into the taxable invoices which would be treated and if it is treated into the simple invoice then the QR code printing on them also is required at this point of time or not. This is also a question which had come to me and I had no answer around it as on today. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm, I'm sure you know, we'll have a lot of such questions where you know we we'll just have to move along as we kind of look at implementing e invoicing for various clients. Right. Uh, maybe another one. It says, "How about exempt supplies outside KSA, which qualify for zero rating? Is e invoicing required?" Yes, for any zero rating uh, supply, e invoice will be required. Mm. Okay. 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 It, I think uh, for uh, just to add, the out of scope uh, transactions are not required to be part of e invoicing, right? Just for mm -hmm. the sake of awareness next time. Exempt supplies and out of scope and both are uh, not covered under the invoicing, and all the other taxable supplies, yeah. zero rated supplies, has, will be covered as part of the invoice. Okay. Right. We've got a lot of questions around, you know, the sequencing, the invoice numbers uh, being in a sequential manner at uh, a POS or at a company level. And I think Akash did mention it in a, uh, a bit of detail in the sense the uh, you know the, the on the face of it it appears that uh, the invoicing number is the number which appears on the invoice but there was i believe akash we discussed earlier before this webinar that there is an faq which really kind of made this question a bit more complex by saying that it is not the invoice reference number but it is the system generated number that needs to be kind of unique and sequential right yes and yes that's people. Kind of so we had a little bit of complexity into the 
Right, right, right. I think uh, that that really brings us to the end of uh, our session. And and thank you, Geet, Neeraj, Akash, for the insights that you really brought from a, a challenge perspective, not just V8, and especially from a systems perspective. Uh, and I'm I'm sure you know uh, a lot of our audience is left with a lot of thoughts and questions. Uh, you know, the team will be really happy to uh, kind of respond to those questions. Just feel free to drop us an email. Uh, you know, my final remarks from my end, uh, the way I look at it is, you know, two or three points. Uh, Akash did use these terms, business critical, you know, the timelines. I, I believe business critical will be very important because uh, the whole custom, the, so B2B especially where, you know, the input tax is really dependent on a correct e-invoice. Right. So if that thing does not happen, really, the customer will not be able to claim input tax right, till you get the correct invoice and that could happen to you as well. So therefore, it's very important that it's just not you, but your vendors and customers are also kind of educated and brought to speed in terms of implementing uh, e-invoicing in their business. The other is timelines. Obviously, you know, uh, again, going back to the poll, 70 percent still uh, kind of looking at the QR code and uh, but considering that we are just four to six weeks till November where, you know, we, we kind of look at having a UAT to ensure that uh, the system is up and running on 4th December. And uh, you know, last point, I think Neeraj also did emphasize a lot on this. And I also feel it's very critical that, you know, you look at e-invoicing implementation as a whole, you know, phase one is pretty straightforward, I believe, you know, it's it's uh, and I believe, you know, if you look at it separately as phase one, phase two, we may end up in phase two with certain challenges, which kind of will kind of lead to a stress, not just on your systems, but also from a cost perspective. Right, Neeraj, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you could emphasize more on this uh, and really it could impact your cost, the timelines, uh, the way you want to implement. And obviously the end is non-compliance with the uh, KSA authorities. So, you know, uh, that's that's all from our end. Thank you so much for attending this uh, webinar. Uh, and as I said, please feel free to get in touch with us. We'll be happy to address all your queries and we hope to see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.